Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements for this message. Now here's this week's message. How are you today? Nice summer. Well, in our summer, we're doing a summer series called Hello, Holy Spirit. This is week two. We started last week. If you missed it, you'll want to make sure and, <clears throat> and uh, listen to it online. We're also doing an all-church study. It's part of your small groups. So if, you're in one of the, if you want to be part of the book that we're reading along with it called Hello, Holy Spirit by Diane Lehman, uh, we're going to be going chapter and chapter. And we're kind of following along the same themes on our weekend services as well. <clears throat> so we're going to be uh, talking about more about the Holy Spirit today. You know, one of the things that I've noticed over the years, and including myself, is, is that most kids, their favorite holiday is what? It's Christmas, right? Why? Because of the gifts, among other things. But the gifts certainly is a big part of it, all the presents. Kids love that. They're not dumb. And most of us, not just kids, but we love, we like presents, right? Gift giving, gift receiving, Sharon and I, over uh, the years, we used to, uh, when we would travel, when our kids were young, we'd try to bring back a gift for them, like many of you have probably done. And uh, as they got older, though, it got harder to do that. They got pickier. It was harder to, they're young adult, you know, men now. And, you know, we, 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 sometimes we don't even bring them back something. Because we know if we bring them back something that's too cheesy, they'll go, oh, uh, why don't you just give me, like, some money or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> so a year ago, we were on a business trip, Sharon and I, in Juneau, Alaska. We had never been there before. <coughs> and um, in between two meetings, we had enough time to go and uh, look around at some shops. So we were looking at some places. And we were thinking, hey, maybe we'll find something here, you know, for, for our kids, for our, our three sons and our soon-to-be daughter-in-law. And then we walked into this one uh, shop. They sold a bunch of eclectic stuff. But one of the things that they had a lot of was these animal skins. And this is Alaska. So all these animal skins, and we thought, well, that's so, they don't have something like that. It's kind of a guy gift. They'll probably like that. And, and uh, particularly, they had a lot of foxes because I guess there's overpopulation, kind of like we have sometimes deer overpopulation issues. And so would you like to see one of them? I, I asked one of my kids to bring one in. This is what we gave them. This is an Arctic fox. See, isn't he cute? Oh, some of your animal lover, you're thinking, what is wrong with you, you know? Why, wh what kind of gift is that? I mean, it's, got, it's still got his little feet and everything, you know? You can actually put your hand inside him and then make him like a, a puppet. No. <laughs> I, I do have issues, I guess. You're right, you know? <laughs> but anyway, so we, uh, and so we, got, we got each one of them one of these, uh, similar to this. Uh, uh, this one and then two other ones. And then for our soon-to-be daughter-in-law, we thought we got to include her. So we got her a rabbit skin purse. And when we gave it to her, she kind of looked at us like, what kind of family am I marrying into? <laughs> this, is, this is, they've got problems. <laughs> gift giving, it's fun. Especially if you like the gift, right? Now we're talking about the Holy Spirit. And you see descriptions of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit's our comforter, our strengthener, strengthener, he prays for us. And, and yet you see another thing, that he is the gift giver. In fact, it's the dominant description of the Holy Spirit. He gives gifts. This is a good deal because we love getting gifts. We're kind of made that way. God loves to give us gifts through the Holy Spirit. And we, if we're able, if we're receptive, we receive gifts. We receive those gifts. Notice at the top of your outline, <coughs> we're going to be looking at a number of verses in Corinthians. If you're following along in the Bible, you can open it up to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 12, <coughs> Paul says this. He says, now about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. So 
people didn't understand in that day how spiritual gifts work, how to get them, what they're for. That might be true today, too. I mean, there's still people that Paul would say are ignorant when it comes to understanding spiritual gifts. The purpose of them, why do we have them? How do we use them? That's part of what we're going to be talking about, specifically this week and next week, so you won't want to miss next week either. Uh, We're going to go into it in even more in depth, not only here in the weekend service, but in our small groups. But today I want to just cover five overarching purposes or truths of the uh, of the of, of the Holy Spirit and the spiritual gifts. Number one, spiritual experiences. Thank you. Spiritual experiences uh, draw us to Christ. Spiritual experiences that God gives us, the Holy Spirit gives us, will draw us to to Christ, to the Lordship of Jesus. Notice he says there in uh, verses two and three. Remember how you were when you didn't know God. Led from one phony God to another. Some translations refer to that as an idol, some idol. And he says, never knowing what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else did it. It's different in this life. God wants us to use our intelligence to seek to understand all we can. Now, I want you to know that if you are led by God's Spirit, you will say that Jesus is Lord and you will never curse Jesus. So here you have a couple things. First of all, right off the bat, it's obvious to see he's saying, you know, if you're a Christ follower, if God's, if you're being led by the Lord, you're not going to be cursing in Jesus' name. This is, a, this is a common thing, right? I mean, people curse, and Jesus is a favorite curse word, right? They just throw out his name. They don't, sometimes they don't even need to put something else with it. It's just by itself. It's just like, yeah, that's a cool curse word. I did it as well. Before I came to Christ, I was a number one in cursing using Jesus' name. I did it all the time. I loved to curse. It was one of my favorite things to do. All the time cursing. And all the time throwing Jesus' name in it. Every few sentences. Sprinkle in Jesus with, and marry it up and pair it up with other curse words. I probably offended tons of people. Didn't even know, really didn't even care. This is my thing. My, and then I came to Christ and I started praying and I would pray in Jesus' name and I started, it started making sense that, hey, Maybe I shouldn't be cursing the God I'm asking to bless me, you know. I mean, I, you know, I didn't wake up yesterday. So he says, hey, if you're being led by the, by the Spirit, you shouldn't be doing that. shouldn't be cursing Jesus' name. He also talks about phony gods. He says that, hey, there's spiritual experiences, certainly that are not connected to God, but they don't necessarily produce something positive. He says th- th- they're, they're phony. It, it leads to... Uh, often things that are destructive and not helpful. Now, in our country, people are hungry in spiritual experiences more than ever. This is what uh, Barna says. In and, and Barna's polls, there people are, are wanting spirituality at record levels. You see, science doesn't answer some of the deep things of the meaning of life, what's my purpose in life, how do I resolve guilt, How do I get a clear conscience? How do I get through regret? How do I learn how to really love? Uh, How do I have great relationships? And and, and these things are bigger than science can answer. And so they're looking for spiritual answers to these things. Unfortunately, they're not going to to Christ, a lot of them. A lot of them, if you look at, you Google celebs and and, uh, what kind of, faith they have or their religion. A lot of them will say, hey, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm, I'm not religious. I don't go to church. They're looking for something. They're just not sure. There's a couple of reasons why it's so popular right now to, uh, to not uh, tie yourself to uh, Christianity in your search for uh, spiritual, spiritual uh, answers. The consumer appeal, one is, is that it, why have any kind of restriction on your life? How about a spiritual experience that has no kind of uh, uh, call to moral guidance? You know, I can just do whatever I want. I can accumulate all I want, and I can do it. I can be as selfish as I want. I can, I can hurt people if I want. I, can, I don't have to forgive people. Jesus said, see, he says that if you're going to follow, he says, if, if those who follow me, he goes, you must pick up your cross and deny yourselves. Well, that's no fun. Right? Who wants to do that? You know, who wants to deny themselves? Who wants to put on these kinds of restrictions? Let's just blame it on our culture and say, oh, we have a repressive society. And they, they don't like the freedoms that we have. 
Let's just blame it like that. Instead of, instead of what Christ wants to do in our lives is actually grow us and think about others. It's not just all about me. And so spiritual experiences, there's a new spirituality out there where there's, where there's no, uh, you know, no ethical demands on people. You can lie because it's convenient for you. You can deceive uh, in, in the marketplace because you'll make a little more money. You can eat whatever you want regardless of the consequences of your health or whatever. I mean, just there's, why have any kind of restrictions at all? There's another reason, though, and the Christian church has, has neglected to really have the spiritual experiences in their congregations, in the church. This is the place where you would expect it to be, right? People come, they visit church. Hey, what's going on, man? Well, here's how it works. Uh, we have a, a, a Bible teaching, and we have a favorite song that we sing, a couple of those. We have a great kids program. This is church. Well, this is not church. This, that, there's, those are nice things to have in a church, but friends, we need to have an experience with the Holy Spirit. We need to have an encounter with God. People are wanting that. They, they, they're not just wanting uh, just some, a good programming. They, they want to know God is here. He's in my midst. There's, he's in the presence. There's something significant here. God is real. This is one of the things that Paul describes with the spiritual gifts. He says when the spiritual gifts are manifesting, he goes, people will proclaim God is in our midst. God is real. Takes the invisible God and makes him real. So these are important. Now, the church has... In, 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 in many cases, has neglected that. And so you have church services where there's, there's not a whole lot going on. You know, in Jesus' day, he had some encounters, some friction with religious leaders. One of, that, one of the groups was called the Sadducees. The Sadducees were a group of people that, uh, they, 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 they were faithful religious people, but they just didn't believe in the miraculous. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels and demons. They were basically anti-supernaturalists. Supernatural, they're really not into it. But they're super religious. Well, Jesus, he said, he called them, down, called them down on that. Said, hey, this is, that is not at all the kingdom of God. That is not at all what I represent. He talks about bringing the, the power of, of, of God into our midst. And so we don't want to be guilty of Sadducean Christianity, doing the same thing, opening up our Bibles, reading about amazing miracles of the past, and then just go, wow, wouldn't it have been great if we'd lived in those times? Look at what Jesus did. Isn't that amazing? Look at what the apostles did. And then just talking about the future. Well, when we die, you know, we go to heaven. So there's an upside on where we're at. And just, but hang on, because nothing's happening now. Just hang on, and someday we'll go to heaven. This is not the gospel, friends. This is not the gospel. The gospel is God's power available to us now through the Holy Spirit, which is, which is, which is what Paul says when he goes, hey, listen, when I came and preached, he's talking to the Corinthians. He goes, I certainly argued and uh, proclaim the gospel. He goes, but really it was all about the spiritual gifts, the power that was associated with it. Notice there in 1 Corinthians 2, he says, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. You see, we have to offer something more compelling than just good arguments. It's got to be God's power. Number two, the spiritual gifts help us to experience God's presence. This is the point of it. Uh, there in verse 4, he says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. As I said, depending on your background, you may not even believe in the gift. Somebody might have taught you, oh, yeah, the gifts don't operate anymore. They did back in the day, but they're gone now. They're, they've ceased. Or maybe your church uh, uh, government didn't, didn't allow that or whatever. But... Friends, let me tell you, here at Vineyard Community Church, we do not tear pages out of our Bible. We don't just tear that out and go, well, that's, that doesn't apply anymore. That's, uh, that's, that's over. No, we, we believe in it all. We believe in it all. It's kind of hard to tear pages out of your Bible if you have an electronic Bible anyways. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Where they just say, no. And we say, hey, all of the New Testament is relevant today. Whatever we see, we believe it. Well, if it's in the Bible, we believe God is at work today. He says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. The Greek word 
for that word spiritual gift is the word charis, charis, which is where we get our word charismatic. That's the, the charismatic is the charismatics have the gifts. They believe in the gifts. The modern Greek word for char, uh, charismata is birthday gift. That's what in modern Greek, that's what it means. The root of that is grace, grace. A grace gift is what the spiritual gifts are. Now, here's the, the importance of that. See, grace is a unique Christian term. You won't find it in any other religion because it's not, it doesn't make any sense to us. Grace is something that you give. God gives just because he loves us. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. Zero. Z and so that's how we come to come to Christ. That's how we come to get uh, access into the Father and into heaven. It's, it's nothing we did. It's all Jesus did because of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, because of his life, we benefit from him. Nothing we did. Only God would come up with something like that. This is grace. And grace is true with gifts as well. It's not because the, the nature of talking about the Holy Spirit and gifts is when we st start talking about that, we start to feel inadequate. Like, pff, who am I? Why would God give me a gift? Right? I mean, I don't deserve it. I don't pray six hours a day. I'm not a spiritual giant. I don't fast Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I still get angry when somebody cuts me off. I still argue on the way to church. I still, you know, have some addictions that I'm trying to work through and some behavior I'm not proud of. And, you know, I'm a midget, man. I'm a spiritual midget. I'm not a spiritual giant. Why would God give me a gift? And here's why. It's because it's his pleasure to do it. It's his grace. He just gives spiritual gifts. This is why you can have very, very mature Christians, people that have been serving God faithfully, reading their Bible, growing in character for years and years and years, and yet operate in zero spiritual gifts. And then you can have somebody who has all kinds of problems. They've come to Christ, but they have a lot of work to do. And, uh, and yet they operate in multiple spiritual gifts because it's not based on works, on what you've done to earn it. It's... Simply, you have to believe, though. You have to have enough faith to believe. Not a whole lot, just a little bit of faith and believe that God is the dispenser of gifts. That's how you enter into that. That's how you walk into that. So spiritual gifts are not a measure of somebody's maturity. A great example of this is the Corinthians. Paul is talking to Corinth. All of these gifts are going on. That's why he's talking about it. But throughout the letter, if you read it, he says, hey, you guys got a lot of issues going on. You're arguing all the time. You're backbiting. You're slandering. He says you're cheating. You're suing each other. You're lying. You're, uh, you're arguing at the communion table. I mean, he, he lists one thing after another. All of these things. There's immorality. But there's this flourishing ministry of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Great. It's, it's, it's because why? It's not based on your mature your maturity your spiritual maturity there is a thing about there is an issue there god does want us to grow though spirit and with spiritual maturity he refers to that in a number of places one is here in galatians when he calls it fruit fruit because fruit you know if you go to the grocery store you get fruit in the produce section right it's it's a produce it's something that's produced you work at it and it takes a while for it to be uh, productive in your life here he gives a list of nine. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So these nine, these are nine characteristics that grow, and they grow over time. But there's no overlap, no correlation to those and spiritual gifts. Gifts are given by God's grace, for God's, by His grace. And the, here's the one, something that you need to know. The Bible says that when we receive a gift and we start to use it, it grows our faith. So we need it just a little bit to get in, but then when we start allowing God to use us in, a, in, in one of these gifts, our faith grows because of it. Our faith grows because of it. Parents, let me ask you, when you give your kids a gift, why is it, uh, for, for their birthday, for example, why do you give them a gift? Is it because that each year you give them an annual child obedience performance test? And, you, you know, how well did you, did you obey this year? And, uh, you know, if they, if they were a rascal, no, you don't get anything. If they're really super obedient, they get an extra beautiful gift. No, it doesn't work like that, right? You just give them a gift because they, they probably didn't deserve it. But you give it to them anyways because you love them, right? You love them. God gives gifts to us because he loves us. 
We don't have to have some kind of obedience performance chart. Paul says there, brothers, and, and I add, your, and sisters, he says, think of what you were when you were called. He's saying, he's kind of saying, listen, it, let's, let's take an evaluation. Here he goes, he's, he's going to give them a quick uh, performance evaluation. He goes, not many of you were wise by human standards. I think he just insulted him there, all right? If somebody says that to me, uh, you're not wise by too many standards. I think, hey, what are you saying? Not many were influential, not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. In other words, you didn't have any merit badges, you didn't have anything to talk about, and yet God chose you. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and, despised the, and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. God wants to use everybody he wants to use uh, the, the, uh, the parent and the kid, the teacher, the educator, and the student. He wants, to use, he wants to use professionals, and he wants to use non-professionals. He wants to use doctors and dock workers and homemakers and home builders across the board. Everybody, God says, I want to just pour my gifts out on people. Now, the beautiful thing about when God gives us gifts is, is he, doesn't, he doesn't make us into something else, somebody different. It's not like he gives us a gift and all of a sudden we act differently. Because sometimes people are worried about that. Gosh, if I get a gift, you know, then all of a sudden I'm going to be like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be acting weird. You know, my grandparents and my parents told me about these holy rollers. Where I see these people on TV and they're weird, man. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be one of those people. God uses you just the way you are. We like to refer to it here in the vineyard as being naturally supernatural. You're supernatural, but you do it in the way that God made you. you you're, you're you. And so if you're a feeler, you don't have to be a thinker. If you're a thinker, you don't have to become a feeler. If you're not that emotional, you don't have to become emotional. If you're a task person, you don't have to become a people person. If you're a people person, you don't have to be a pa task person. God uses you, and he just operates the gifts through you like you would. I mean, I, think, I don't think Jesus was weird. Think of all the times he was invited to parties all the time. Well, people that are weird don't get invited to parties. <laughs> right? He's always invited to parties because he makes people feel good about themselves, feel relaxed. He doesn't judge them. He's got timely words for their lives. He's got encouraging things to say. He stays away from all the religious hype. And I think Jesus was just who he was. He didn't put on a different persona. I'm Jesus now, man. Here I am. Now I'm about to do some miracles. Get ready. It's coming. No, I don't think he did all that. I think he just, it just flew, it just flowed naturally out of his life. And that's how God wants us to be. Just, he wants to use us just the way that you are. I read this quote by Jim Gaffigan. He said this, he said, he said, when we were kids, it didn't matter if someone was religious. It just mattered if they were annoying. Isn't that true? <laughs> <laughs> let's just not be annoying use the gifts that God gives us without all the weirdness that goes along with it third thing that Paul says about spiritual gifts is spiritual gifts are for serving see it's not selfish to serve it's not selfish to see. when it comes to God's gifts God gives us gifts so that we can serve him and serve others better there in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians 12 there are different kinds of service but the same Lord the word service in Greek is diakonon, which is where we get our word uh, deacon. Deacons back in the New Testament days, they were servants, servants around the church. He goes, this is what the gifts are for. They're, they're, they're meant to serve others. We can serve better when we, have, when we, when we uh, operate in, in, the, in the gifts of, that God gives us. So it's not just God bless me. It's God, I want to in, be an encouragement to people that are discouraged. And so God, give me words of prophecy so I can be an encouragement. Uh, Lord, when people are sick, that there's something in me that wants to reach out. I'm not, maybe you're not a medical professional, but you want to help. God gives gifts of healing. In the list in Romans 12, I, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 12, the list of gifts, it's the only plural gift. of It says gifts of healing. There's gift of tongues, gift of interpretation, gift of prophecy, gift of faith, and there's gifts of healing because no, no one person has all the gifts. There's lots, of, there's lots of work to be done. And we get to partner with God in bringing physical and mental and all kinds of healing to people that have infirmities of all types. And so when we join up with God, we're saying, I want to be a servant. 
I want to serve in some way. I want to help people that are, that are in need. You know, speaking of sickness, some of you might be thinking, well, doesn't God use medical science and, you know, medicine to, to heal people? Certainly God can do that and does do that. God uses medicine of, of the day. Jesus used medicine of his day. And, and he would pray for people and use medicine of his day. In some of his stories, he talked about that as well. So that happens to us, we, but God also heals. It's not like this one or the other. Last year, I tore my ACL. I had it repaired by a surgeon, and he, and he repaired it. I'm thankful for that. When I was in high school, I shattered my left ankle, and the surgeon did what he could, but after two surgeries, he says, this is all I could do. He goes, it's, you're going to have a limp the rest of your life. A year later, I went to a healing service in a church. God healed it, just straight up. And so there, you have a combination of a surgeon and God kind of bringing healing. Then when I was, we were, uh, Sharon and I had a hard time having kids when we, one of our pregnancies, it was looking like our son who ended up being born was not going to make it. They said, oh, he's got this very complicated, very advanced stage of pulmonary sequestration. His heart was pushed over to the other side of his chest. His lungs were not developed. It, 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 they said he's going to be born, stillborn. And the doctor said, there's nothing we can do for you. Each week we'd come back, and every time you go, well, it's worse now. There's nothing we can do. Of course, they recommended abortion, those kinds of things. We continued to pray on our own, and then one day towards the very end of the pregnancy, uh, he said, it's healed. I mean, it happened within a week's period of time. He called on his whole office staff. Look, I guess these people are pastors. I guess this is a miracle or something. <laughs> uh, doctor couldn't help at all. So there's a, sometimes God uses medicine sometimes he uses a combination sometimes he just does it because he loves us and sometimes he doesn't heal i don't you know what we're in this this place where the kingdom of god is coming it's at hand as jesus says but it's not fully here all you have to do is look around in the world you can see well it's not fully here yet but god tells us to continue to pray your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven because it's not on earth yet fully but it's coming and there's breakthrough points when healing occurs but not everybody's healed and we are continue to pray for those places and it, we don't, just because everybody's not healed doesn't mean we don't pray anymore I mean, it's possible if somebody goes hey listen i'm not feeling very well can you pray for me you can think well, yeah but you might not get prayed you might not get healed it's true they might not but is that the reason to not pray you know yeah you might not get yeah i might as well not pray for you it sounds kind of awkward, right? But it's, it's the way we kind of live sometimes. It's kind of the way we actually practice our faith. Listen, when you look at the New Testament, when you read the New Testament, you look at Jesus' life, when he prayed for people, there's a lot of people with infirmities, and you see healing after healing that Jesus encounters people and he heals them. Have you noticed when he, when he prays for them, it's right there in the moment? When somebody says, oh, yeah, uh, you know, Rabbi, please pray for me. Please heal me. He doesn't say, oh, I'll add you to my prayer list. You know? There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Intercessory prayer is very powerful. And God does heal through intercessory prayer. I'm just saying you don't see that in the New Testament, at least as a predominant way. Mostly it was right there in the moment. You know, he, you know I need healing. Okay, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now. I challenge you. You, as God starts to, if we're going to stir up the gifts in this church, pray in the moment. Right there. Stop saying, I'll add you to my prayer list. I'll pray for you. And then we don't anyways, actually. We kind of forget. Somebody asks you, hey, how, are you still praying for me? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What was that again? What was it? Let's just, you know what? I, there's an easy answer to that. Pray for them right then and there. Say, I don't have time. Sure, you have 15, 20 seconds. I'm not saying have a prayer marathon. In fact, if you look again at the New Testament, you see the prayers are actually usually one sentence long. It's not this long, long thing. Now, there's no, again, nothing wrong with a longer prayer. I'm just saying, if you're busy, you have biblical precedents. <laughs> hey, I don't have a lot of time, but you know, Jesus, he did it quick, so let me just pray for you quick. <laughs> and just pray in the moment right there. Watch the gifts get stirred up when we start to do that. The Bible says, earnestly desire spiritually gifts. See, we need to, it's got to be something we desire. It's got to be on our radar. I want this. I want to serve others better. I want to be used by God in this way. On the back of your outline, number four, spiritual gifts are different than abilities 
or talents. They're different. Some people might say, well, my spiritual gift is music or my spiritual gift is quilt making or painting or writing or mechanics. But really, those are abilities, the talents that God has given you when you were created. And then we choose to develop them. Some people do not develop their talents. That's unfortunate. But we develop our talents. That's different than a spiritual gift. Notice in verse 6, he says, there are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. All men, he's talking about all men and women in the body of Christ. And then this key word working is the Greek word energimata, which is where the word we get energy from. It's the same word that's talking about the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead. He goes, that's the kind of energy that's operating in the spiritual gifts. You see, it's not just your talent plus a little extra. You know, like a little boost. Boof. No, it's not your ability that you're comfortable with. Often it's something you're not comfortable with. It's not something you've developed. It's something way outside of your comfort zone, which is why some people don't move in the spiritual gifts. They don't earnestly desire and pray for the spiritual gifts because there's this sense of insecurity that goes with it. We're uncomfortable with spiritual gifts because of change. It causes change, exploring things outside of your experience. You know, all of these new ways of doing things. You know, I'm, I'm not used to that. Well, yeah, it's going to be different than your natural talents. And so we can start to feel uncomfortable because, it's not, you know, we, especially if you've been a Christian a long time, you've gone to church a long time, we tend to pride ourselves in knowing a lot. You know, you've read through the Bible a few times. So people ask about a Bible question. No, I know where that is. Let me show you. <laughs> me. See, I know where that is. It's awesome. Thank you. You know, and then it's time to sing the songs. And I know that verse. You see the other people around you don't really sing, know, know, know the song very well. You sing extra loud. People are kind of, dang, man. You got it going on. Yeah, that's me. And so when we get into spiritual gifts, we're, we're uncomfortable. We, we don't have that level of security. We don't know what's coming next. God doesn't reveal all of it to us when we're, you know, it, I guess it'd be easier if, if he did, right? If he, like, gave us an email each morning. Today, these are the things. This is how things are going to unfold. You go, wow, oh, I got that then. But he doesn't. It's almost like driving in a fog, right? You think, I can't see very well. I got to slow down. I got to try to crawl along. I can't go at my normal speed. Here, I got a plan. I'll just turn on my floodlights. And now it's worse, right? It just reflects back at you. God, I can't see. There's no way around it. It's slowing down, waiting on God, and this makes people uncomfortable. Another reason we get uncomfortable is because spiritual gifts put God in the driver's seat. We're no longer in the driver's seat. And some people really like to be in the driver's seat. Each of us is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So it's the manifestation. It's not something you work on, you work up on your own. It's something that God is doing. He's manifesting himself. And so if you're somebody who likes to plan and plot, plan your plan, work your plan, it gets difficult. Because you start thinking, hmm, I'm not sure where this is going. I want to fit into God's plans, but I've got to slow down. I've got to figure that out. Now, the, spir the spiritual gifts are all about making the invisible God visible. I mean, how do you make God who's invisible visible? People come in all the time in these services and they go, is, they're thinking, if they're not saying it out loud, is God real? Does God love me? Does God care about me? Is there real power in the world that God can change my circumstances? They're wondering these things and they deserve an answer. And see, so spiritual gifts are an answer to that question, those questions. An invisible God visible, made visible. You can't, with a naked eye, you can't see electrons. But we know they're there when we turn on our TV and we can see that we go, oh, it's electrons that made this. Or when you have your hair dryer and you feel the heat, you go, yeah, electrons are real. You turn on the, the, the light bulb, yes, electrons are real. But you can't see them with a naked eye. So we can't see the invisible God with a naked eye, but we see the manifestations of God through the spiritual gifts. That's what he says. It's manifested through these gifts. And so it answers those important questions. When we're sharing our faith, the Bible, the Bible talks about, you know, arguing for the cause of Christ. That's really helpful. Maybe even better than that is, is good works. 
Go, being a person of integrity in the workplace. Be, if being honest with people. If you do it somebody's job and it doesn't take you as much time, you're, you're honest with them. Hey, it didn't take me as much time. Here's the money back. Here's the money. I'm not going to charge you the full rate. See, that's a powerful witness when you do that for Christ. But even better than those two, than, sh than, than, than uh, debating and arguing and, and, good, and, and good works is spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts demonstrate the power of God when we have God at work in our midst. A third reason why people are uh, sometimes uncomfortable about spiritual gifts is they're afraid that maybe God will reveal something. Because part of what God does is uncover things that are secret. And so here Paul says, Now suppose you speak what God has revealed and the, the secrets in their hearts become known. All of us have secrets. None of us want them. They're secret because we don't want them out, right? That's why we didn't tell anybody. And now God's kind of like pulling a fast one. He's saying, hey, I'm going to share that secret that you didn't want out. Thinking, hey, I don't think I want to sign up for that. That doesn't feel, that doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't make me feel comfortable. And this is part of what happens. But listen, in my experience, God does not reveal every secret. He does sometimes reveal secrets. Not all secrets are sin, by the way. Sometimes secrets are things we're just ashamed of. We, you know, somebody maybe hurt us in some way and we've never really dealt with it. Sometimes secrets are, are secrets that we have about doubt, about our faith. There's all kinds of secrets. And when God reveals those secrets, it's because he wants us closer to him. He wants us to have healthy, strong relationships with others. He does it for a reason, because he cares about us, and he knows that we can't live the full life that he has for us with that secret. That's why he's dealing with it. And so when you learn to trust God, when you realize God has my best interests in mind, you can step more confidently into this area of spiritual gifts. Jesus, referring to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, said, when the Holy Spirit comes, when he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. So that is an aspect of, of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Number five, spiritual gifts are for the building of community. They're for building community. God wants us to have strong community relationships within the church and with one another, but specifically within the church. Here he says there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them and all men. So when Paul, in addressing the Corinthians, talks over and over about restoring relationships, treating people right, building community, and here he says, talking about gifts, he says, real, and he uses the Trinity as a metaphor, Sharon talked about the Trinity last week. Trinity. And here he says it, and he lists them. Verse 4, he says, the same Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, he says, the same Lord. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Th then verse 6, he says, the same God. That's God the Father. And he uses this as a model because, the, because God is one, but he's three persons. Three in one. It's the Trinity. And so there's this unity, incredible unity in the Trinity. Interdependent, interpenetration, needing one another, depending on one another. He says that is what the body of Christ should be like. We care for one another. And the gifts of the Spirit bring that to light. And notice he lists the Holy Spirit first. Even though we would normally, the Holy Spirit usually gets listed last, right? No, he's the, you know, the Holy Spirit usually gets kind of like third fiddle, so to speak. The most inconspicuous. And he lists that first because in the body of Christ, even what we would consider in, inconspicuous gifts, people that don't seem to have as much gifting, he lists them first because he says, you know, everybody matters. Everybody is important. Every gift, in the body of Christ, every gift is needed. Everybody is, and, and listen, we can easily attend weekend services in a church like this where you don't really get to know people. You're not, your gift is not deployed. It's not discovered. That's why we have small groups, and small groups is where we can connect with one another, we can build relationships, we can grow. It's a powerful expression of the Trinity and, and what God wants to do through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Last verse, now all of you together are Christ's body, and each one of you is a separate and necessary part of it. He says every single one is a necessary part of what God is doing. Let's bow our heads and pray.
Well, Lord, I, I pray against any kind of spiritual opposition that might be happening. You might not even be aware of it if you're here today. You just know that you don't feel comfortable or you have these voices kind of yelling competitive thoughts, maybe distracting thoughts. So, for Heavenly Father, we just anoint this next moment of prayer. Say, Lord, we want to hear your voice louder than any voice at all. We give you permission, Lord, to speak. You are the gift giver, so we invite you, Holy Spirit. If you've never invited the Holy Spirit into your life, never invited Christ in the work of the cross and what he did for you, this is your next step. This is what you need to do. So you go in prayer right now, just you and God. This is not about joining the church. This is about you recognizing what Jesus did for you on the cross and receiving his grace, his grace gift. The greatest gift of all is salvation, where you just go, God, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Just do that right now. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Give me the greatest gift of all, the gift of salvation. The gift of a relationship with my heavenly Father. Now I would pray for you and I just pray, Lord, I can't lay hands physically on everybody here, Lord, but as I extend my hands, Lord, I say pour your gifts out on this body. Let your gifts flow. Lord, I pray that we would not be afraid of well, what people think of us. Let us be secure in who we are in Christ. Let us know that you give good gifts to your children. And so, Lord, I pray that you, you let your, your, your power come, Lord. Some of you, you cannot pray effectively. You struggle in prayer. Squeak out a little prayer over dinner, or over your kid, or something from here to here, from here to there. Sometimes here, sometimes there. God wants to unleash a torrent of prayer, and that's what tongues is about. We're going to talk about that more next week. But would you begin by saying, God, if that is truly a gift for me, I'm open. That's a good prayer to start. Say, I'm open. I want to operate in the spiritual gifts. Watch my prayer life be transformed. Some of you, you struggle with reading God's Word, the Bible. It's boring. It doesn't make sense. It's complicated. You have ev and then everything in its way comes at you when you're trying to read. And so you just don't, truth be told. God wants to give you the gift of wisdom and knowledge to unlock the treasures that are in there. Would you say, God, give me the gift to understand your word, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom. And so, Lord, I pray, I breathe on every soul here, Lord. Let your gifts flow. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com and we'll see you next week.